Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here with us today for the Badger Institute's symposium series, how Missouri passed the best occupational licensure reform bill in the country. We have a great group of people here today from Wisconsin and really across the country who are both interested and knowledgeable about licensing reform. And so we're looking forward to this energetic and informative conversation here today. My name is Julie Grace. I am a policy analyst at the Badger Institute Center for Opportunity. I will be modeling moderating today's discussion between our two panelists. And we will also be recording today's event and streaming it on Facebook Live. Um, so that we'll make sure that the recording is available afterwards for anyone who's interested. Um, for those who who aren't familiar with us, the Badger Institute is a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank. We are guided by the beliefs that free market and limited government, private initiative, and personal responsibility are essential to our way of life. We are based in Milwaukee, but we research issues that impact the entire state of Wisconsin, including two of the issues that we'll talk about today, occupational licensing and criminal justice, as well as others like taxes, transportation, workforce, federalism issues. More information um, on our work and our work itself can be found on our website, badgerinstitute.org. As I mentioned, this is part of our symposium series where we really look um, to find experts from across the country to discuss issues and topics that are relevant to our state. And our guests here today are not only experts on the issues themselves, but they're also experts on the process that it took to get these good ideas into law because they were the two that helped do that in Missouri. So Derek Greyer is a state representative from Missouri where he was first elected in 2016. And Brian Williams is a Missouri state senator first elected in 2018. And together, Representative Greyer, a Republican, and Senator Williams, a Democrat, helped pass one of the most comprehensive occupational licensing bills in the country. So I will start by asking our guests some questions on the legislation and how it became law. And then later we will open it up to audience questions. So um, just be thinking of your questions as we go and feel free to pop them into the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So with that, let's get started. Um, I will start with a question for Representative Greyer. Um, to kick us off, can you just give us an overview of what your legislation was, what it did, and kind of what led you to conclude that licensure recognition was needed in your state. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to. And uh, I got to tell you, I'm really excited to, to be here with you, Julie, and the Badger Institute. You guys are doing really good work and uh, appreciate all of, uh, all of your efforts to, to help with some of these causes that are so important uh, to your state and, and really to the, to the rest of the country. Um, so the story about occupational licensing kind of goes like this. So um, I was looking for a way that uh, that I could find kind of a niche that uh, that I, I could fill in Missouri and be an expert on something. That was some advice I got early on in my legislative career was find something that you can be the go to for and, and be an expert on. And so I started looking for um, ideas and um, types of legislation that would interest me. And the idea of work is something that, that uh, is intriguing to me because it's so important. It's so fundamental to what has allowed our country to be so successful and that will enable us to continue to be successful, this idea uh, of work and the access uh, of people to work. And so often what I have found in my experience is, professionally and um, in, in the legislature is that often government can, can do a lot of harm in getting the way and creating artificial barriers to entry and really making it harder for people uh, to, to, to go to work and, and be contributing members of society. And so I started kind of digging in and trying to look for ways that we could make it easier for people to work. I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, my parents started uh, their business about 36 years ago when we moved to Missouri. Um, and so I kind of saw them uh, go through a lot of different challenges. Uh, I myself am in an industry that uh, requires a professional license. So in any case, I, I started to see that there were a lot of opportunities for, for progress there. Um, I was at a conference last summer well, a summer and a half ago, I guess, in 2019, and had the opportunity to meet with Governor Ducey and uh, learned about what they had done with occupational license reciprocity. 
And it's this idea that if you have a professional license and you have gotten that license in another state, uh, that you should be able to take that that license with you and be able to transfer to another state and immediately plug into the workforce and begin to work. Uh, and that there shouldn't be this uh, duplicative training, that there shouldn't be these, again, artificial barriers to entry that make it harder for you. You, you don't lose your skills when you move from one state to another, right? You take your skills with you. So now in an environment where it used to be one in every 20 professions was licensed just a few decades ago. Now it's one in every four professions requires government permission to work. Uh, and often the, the training and requirements that you have to go through are very, very extensive. And they were originally supposed to only include health, safety, and well-being, right? They were supposed to protect the health, safety, and well-being of the public. Well, they've gone way, way beyond that in a lot of ways. And so this idea of license reciprocity basically means that as you move through the United States, you ought to be able to, if your, if your family needs take you somewhere new, that you can plug in right away and continue your profession. And you shouldn't be hindered by the government from doing that, as long as there's not a legitimate risk to health, safety, and wellness. And what we found is that most of those health, safety, and wealth, wellness arguments ha have really been debunked. Uh, and we can get into more of that in, in a few minutes, I'm sure. But with the healthcare uh, needs that we have had recently here, it's really shown the need to be able to, especially for healthcare workers, nurses, practitioners, that sort of thing, to be able to take those skills and plug in where there's a need in our country and where there's a need with, with the health. And it, the same thing applies to so many other professions. Yeah, it's certainly something that we've, we've seen is, is necessary, perhaps more so now than ever before. Um, so, Senator Williams, I, I have a question for you. And um, you were instrumental in getting this bill through the Senate, which um, I believe passed unanimously in, in the Missouri State Senate, which is amazing. Um, and one of the aspects of the bill that you were instrumental in, in passing is what was called the Fresh Start Act which essentially makes it easier for people with criminal records to obtain an occupational license. Can you tell us a little bit about that and why that aspect of the legislation was so important? No, absolutely, Julie. First, I wanna uh, thank you as well as the Badger Institute for hosting uh, this symposium. I think it's extremely important for uh, everyone to come together and have constructive conversations. Not only how we ensure that folks have access to professional licensing, but also how do we uh, increase our workforce and, and ultimately uh, tackle um, unprecedented disparities, uh, for example, with the Missouri Fresh Start Act. As we know, uh, employment reduces recidivism. So across the country, statewide uh, rates of recidivism range from roughly 31 to 70 percent. Uh, but for those placed in jobs shortly after they're released, uh, range from only three to eight percent, and that's a huge drop. So helping former offenders find a job uh, keeps our community safe, but also saves the state millions of dollars in prison costs. And the Fresh Start Act bans occupational um, licensing boards from denying licenses based on criminal history, uh, with the exception of violent or uh, sexual crimes or crimes directly related to the licensed profession. So this is a great opportunity to not only um, increase our workforce, but also give uh, folks who may have made a mistake at some point in time in their life uh, a second opportunity to be able to be uh, productive citizens, not only in Missouri, but also uh, set precedent for other states throughout the country. Uh, just to give those a little bit of information about the uh, Missouri Fresh Start Act, um, beginning January 1 of 2021, no person will be disqualified uh, by a state licensing authority uh, because of a prior conviction of a crime, unless the crime is directly related to those duties and responsibilities uh, for the licensed occupation, or if the crime is violent and sexual in nature. So to think that, you know, this, this allows folks to be able to go back into the workforce, do what they love, and not be confined to uh, a, a job that doesn't provide a livable wage or um, allow them to be able to, to do things that ultimately make them happy and support their families in the process. Um, this four-year limitation 
um, does not apply to crimes that are violent, but um, the individual with the criminal record may petition the licensing authority at any time uh, for a determination of whether they would be disqualified from receiving a license. So it still allows folks to be able to go before uh, the board and, and really make the case if there may have been um, some some type of um, information that may not have been disclosed or, or, or maybe it, it may have been a more complex situation that can justify why they still should be in that perfection. Um, the Fresh Start Act does not apply to teachers, accountants, podiatrists, dentists, physicians, uh, surgeons, uh, nurses, uh, pharmacists, real estate brokers, or um, real estate salespersons, um, or peace officers or other law enforcement personnel. So um, that's something else we need to be clear about. And, and ultimately, those are professions where if you were fired or may have been um, released for violating a, a policy or procedure, you probably shouldn't be allowed to do that profession anyway. So that's pretty much an, an overview of the Missouri Fresh Start Act. Um, we're proud to have gotten that done here in the state of Missouri. As you stated before, it was something that was done with bipartisan effort. But I'm also very proud as a member of the Missouri Senate to look back and, and see since I've been there over the past two years, we have been able to really pass an unprecedented number of bipartisan legislation because we're, we're committed to moving Missouri forward and understanding that if we have a strong workforce, if we're addressing issues around recidivism and ultimately giving everyone in Missouri a fair opportunity to be productive citizens, we will move our state forward. And that's what we're doing with this uh, bill. Yeah, and not only was it bipartisan, I just want to say once again, it was unanimous, correct, in the, in the Senate? Correct. Great. I just, just want to get that in there one more time. That's that's great. Um, so, Representative Greyer, um, I have a question for you. And some people on this call might be familiar with um, similar occupational licensing bills that have popped up across the country, um, more so recently, actually, with regards to reciprocity across state lines. But Something about your bill was much different than some of those, and that is the fact that you do not actually have to be a resident of Missouri to apply for reciprocity. Can you talk about that a little bit and why why you wanted that aspect to be included in the law? Yeah, absolutely. And I should probably back up and just give a better overview of the bill as a whole, too. I didn't do a very good sure. job of that. Um, there's really three main components of the bill. The, the reciprocity that we talked about, um, Senator Williams talked about the fresh start aspect of it. The third leg of the bill was related to apprenticeships and allowing apprenticeships uh, to provide a pathway to licensure. Uh, so if there is a, a, a apprenticeship program that's been approved by the Department of Labor, Labor that the Missouri uh, Department of Labor would recognize that and allow that uh, to be used uh, instead of like coursework. So you get on the job training. You know, this is the way we used to train people to work is you would go and you would apprentice uh, and then you would enter that profession. So this, this basically allows for that on the job type training. So three major, major components of this bill, all of them together are the most comprehensive regulatory reform bill in the country, I've been told. That's not just me touting it. That's organizations from around the entire country that have said that. One of the reasons why it's the most comprehensive is exactly what you just mentioned. The fact that we take the license reciprocity um, further than anyone else has. And we take it further by saying you don't have to be a resident of Missouri first before we allow you to transfer your license. And if you think about it, it makes all the sense in the world because if you're moving from another state, you wanna plug into the workforce as quickly as possible. And becoming a resident of a state takes time, right? You have to come and establish your residency first. Well, that can be very difficult. If you're a family and you're, you're the working parent, how are you going to make it for six months without a license and not being able to work? You don't have permission from the government to work in your new place, right? So it makes sense that you would be allowed to work before you become a resident. That's reason number one. Reason number two is in Missouri, we're kind of unique. We have our two economic engines on borders of our state. St. Louis and Kansas City are on the border of our state. We have a lot of transient workers. They come to our economic engine to work, to fill the jobs that our businesses 
in the state have in those economic engines. And a lot of times they may drive back across the border line, which is maybe 10 minutes away, and live in the different state. Well, we still want to support the businesses in our state by enabling those folks to come and work here. So again, it makes sense that you would be able to uh, come and bring your skills with you to fill the jobs that we have in Missouri, fill the needs that we have, uh, and then maybe you go back at the end of the day across the state line. That's okay. I don't have any problem with that. I want to help these businesses fill the jobs they have, um, and we have a lack of skilled workers in our state. Uh, as I traveled around the state uh, a year ago, uh, went to every corner of our state and visited all of the, the different areas uh, that employ lots of folks and smaller towns as well. And I always ask the question, you know, what, what do you need? What, do you, what can we do a better job of? Or what, does your, what is your business lacking? Uh, and every, every single time it was, we just can't find the skilled workers. We've got the jobs, but we can't find the skilled workers. Well, one way to help ease that is to allow people to come to our state to fill those jobs, to be productive and, and add that economic activity to our state without necessarily having to be a resident of the state. So again, that takes it further than any other state has for licensed reciprocity, uh, and it's already doing a lot of good in the state. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I want to talk to both of you about how this bill kind of all came together and passed, but I have one more question for Senator Williams about the Fresh Start Act um, before we get to that. So the Fresh Start Act, which um, there was just a question in the Q&A. This was all one bill, correct? The Fresh Start correct. Act was just one, one component of that. Okay. Um, so the Fresh Start Act um, eliminated what we call um, good moral character or moral turpitude clauses from licensing laws, um, which we've seen in the past uh, many, many times um, impacts people with criminal records um, just at a, a disparate rate. Um, can you talk about why that was so important um, to, to include that in the legislation? Sure. Um, we absolutely want uh, licensed professionals to have good moral ca um, character. So uh, the question becomes, uh, what does that mean uh, specifically and, and who makes that decision? So uh, from state to state, the criteria used to determ uh, determine good moral character can vary significantly. So uh, what that, that um, threshold or that standard in, in Wisconsin can be, can be completely different in Missouri. So that's why we wanted to uh, put in clear common sense definitions for licenses here in Missouri. So other states have already done this and it's working well. For example, uh, in 2019, Oklahoma and Mississippi enacted laws to remove uh, the good uh, moral character clause from their licensure requirements and implemented more objective standards, including a uh, specific list of the criminal records that would uh, disqualify an applicant. Uh, this also allowed uh, Oklahoma and Mississippi to limit the list of crimes to only those offenses that relate to that occupation or those that pose a reasonable threat to public safety. Missouri's law now does the same thing by removing provisions throughout the statute that prevents licensure for crimes involving uh, moral torpitude or that require good moral character. And that standardizes licensure language to refer to the provisions of the Fresh Start Act. So it just creates distinction and allow us to have a more clear uh, and less convoluted definition of moral character when we think about licensure and uh, those who are, are, are meeting that criteria. So it's essentially another way of, of ensuring that only those crimes that are directly related to the license that they're applying for um, would make them ineligible. There's less Absolutely. ambiguity as to what what does moral, good moral character even mean. Um, Absolutely. Okay. So I have a question for, for both of you and feel free to answer it however you'd like. Um, but can you just speak about the process um, and the steps it took to get this bill into law um, and, and how you got it done in a bipartisan manner? This is something that I think some Wisconsin legislators and staffers on the call would be interested in hearing. You wanna start, Derek? Sure, yeah, happy to. Uh, well, the, the first thing it takes is a, um, 
you know, a kind of a passion for the subject, I think. And, and then you have to build what we did anyways. And I don't want to say you have to, but what we did is, is build a broad coalition. So we started by engaging some organizations that have already done a lot of work around this subject matter. So like the Badger Institute, the Institute for Justice, the Women's Foundation. Um, a lot of these organizations already have done extensive studies and research on the issue. And so we engaged them to see if they would be willing to us uh, in our path uh, to move forward with this. And then, of course, with any bill, you know, you have to build a broad coalition within the building, too, or within the legislature. Um, so, you know, we went and we, we reached out to the governor. We reached out to the Speaker of the House. Um, we gauged their temperature and sort of started talking about this issue and sharing why this would be something really important for Missouri to do and why it could really help a lot of Missourians and Missouri businesses. And so we, we started to, to kind of gain some traction that way. Uh, and then, you know, again, like any other bill, once you file the bill, you, you come up with the idea, you help kind of craft it, you get some organizations that have done the research that can help you put together a, a good bill and, and craft it the right way for your state. Uh, then, you know, you've got to just pound the process. Once you, once you file the bill, every step, you've got to make sure that it's moving along and you know, uh, for me personally, the way that I kind of helped move this bill along was, you know, first step is you you file the bill, and then you've got to get it referred by the speaker. So I went and I petitioned the speaker and spoke with him personally and, and talked with him about why this is a good idea to get him to refer the bill. And then once it goes to committee, you've got the chairman who then has the decision of, you know, hearing a bill or not hearing a bill. So making sure that they understand what it is and asking, you know, making that ask to, to get it heard as early in the process as possible. You know, Missouri, we're only in session January through mid-May. So it's a race to get a bill from start to finish. Uh, and there are very few bills that actually make it across the finish line. You know, out of 2,000 plus bills that are filed, we'll have just a handful of maybe 60 to 80 bills that end up uh, making it into law. Um, so every step of the process is just absolutely critical. Um, one of the things we did too was we had some people from out of state come in to talk about um, how it has impacted their state, states that have done this before. Uh, so like Arizona, we had a extensive conversations with them about how the process has gone, trying to anticipate uh, any challenges that we might run into and anticipating some of the objections. So I went and I, I watched all of the debates and the conversations and the committee hearings that happened in Arizona about the subject just a year prior so that I could be ready for some of the questions that came up and, and anticipate what the, what the right answers were to those. And we brought in, um, uh, there was a, uh, a, a good supporter at the Knee Institute uh, that came out and, and actually flew into town to testify in the Senate committee on it. Um, so we had, we had this broad coalition of support to really show the positive impact that this can be and anticipate the objections. And of course, in the Senate, um, with Senator Williams and all of the other senators that, that were supportive of this, it's so important to, to help um, bridge that bipartisan gap, right? Um, so many things are divisive, but there really truly are a lot of issues that we can agree on and that we can work together uh, for common good. And this happens to be one of those subjects that um, is, is really broadly appealing uh, and can have an impact on a lot of different groups. I mean, here we're talking about, you know, licensed professionals, one in every four, and we're talking about, you know, um, uh, prior offenders uh, that we want to be productive citizens. We talk about it all the time, right? Conservatives talk about it as, hey, we want these folks to be productive citizens. They ought to come out and they ought to get to work, you know? And it's like, well, if the government is preventing them arbitrarily from from doing meaningful work, that's our problem. We got to fix that, right? So we can't just harp on, hey, get a job and go to work. We got to actually make that a realistic possibility. And there's barriers that prevent that from happening. So that's, that's something that we can agree on and that I could work with Senator Williams on and say, hey, this is something we've got to do. We got to help. This is, a, this is criminal justice reform, right? Um, so we can, we can attack it from a bunch of different angles. There's a lot of good 
on this particular issue. And it's just really a matter of helping people understand that and then overcoming the fear that is often there. You know, that is the one probably biggest objection, especially with licensed reciprocity, is this fear that, hey, if we, if we do this, we're suddenly going to have this influx of all of these practitioners in Missouri and professionals that aren't professional. They're going to be endangering the health and safety of people. And granted, there are legitimate concerns in a lot of professions with that. You want people to be trained, and we have licenses for a reason. There are a, there are a lot of reasons why there should be licenses. Doctors and physicians, great example. You don't want to have a brain surgeon who has not gone through training and that has, you know, there's a level of expectation of, of what that person should be able to do and the service that they're able to provide. Um, so I think I've gotten a little bit off track here, but I think that, that generally tells you kind of, you know, the, the process, um, it's, it's a long process. This year, I will add one thing, you know, timing is everything uh, with, with these types of issues. And right now, the timing was absolutely, I mean, the, it, was, it was good for the issue of licensed reciprocity from the aspect that it was shining a light on the fact that we need to be able to have these healthcare professionals moving across state lines without restrictive burdens on them, right? If they have to apply for a license in Missouri and wait six months to get it, then we're, we're not going to be able to fill the needs that we have. I mean, you talk about like New York, California, I mean, those areas, it was, it was even, I mean, greater to a much greater extent, right? So it really highlights the need for it. And so I think there was a recognition that, hey, we've got to make sure we're doing everything we can and we've got the right policies in place uh, to be able to support these folks that are, are looking to fill the needs that we have. And so overcoming those objections and that fear and I understand those, you know, those are often based uh, in, in very, from very a good, good place, but we have to be able to, to talk about and articulate um, how those fears maybe aren't merited and, and look to examples of other states that have done this successfully. You know, it's good to be on the leading edge, but not the bleeding edge, right? So I'm very thankful to Arizona for being on the bleeding edge because they were the first ones to really tackle this issue and we could kind of build upon it. And I'm hopeful that other states like Wisconsin will do the same thing and build on what Missouri is doing and what we're already showing as a success. Um, and I, I know that's one thing you wanted to, to talk about, too, is, you know, what are we seeing in Missouri uh, now? And I just met with the department last week to talk about that. And they're already seeing a number of professions and individuals utilizing uh, this bill to great success. Uh, and we're engaging the Department of Corrections to be proactive in the prison system so that we are actually promoting this as a good way for, for individuals who are incarcerated that, hey, once you are, once you are released, there are things that you can do then, and you can start working on that now so that once you leave here, you're ready to integrate into back into society right away and, and you have some skills that you can immediately get to work and you already may have a license or the ability to, to get a license quickly so that you can get to work. That's, that's great to hear that there's already people being positively impacted by this bill. I mean, it was only signed just in July, correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, I would be curious, Senator Williams, what did you see on your side in, in the Senate um, and conversations around this bill? What was your impression on how did, how did we get a unanimous vote in the Senate on this? Very unusual. Yeah, well, I, I don't I don't know if I would necessarily say it's it's it's, it's definitely interesting. First, uh, for those that are listening, um, I want to kind of just back up a little bit um, because we have staffers on the line. We have um, elected officials, policymakers, uh, folks who have um, dedicated their life to trying to make government better and, and ensure that it works for people. Um, I started my career working um, in the Congress as a staffer and was very fortunate in Missouri to be a part of projects where we uh, created some of the largest uh, federal investments like uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency right here in St. Louis, where now there's a roughly $2 billion facility being built in uh, north of downtown St. Louis, which required a bipartisan effort of not only our congressional uh, delegation, but stakeholders throughout the entire state of Missouri. So I understood immediately uh, when I ran for the Missouri Senate two years ago um, that um, 
in every profession, since we're talking about um, with the workforce and 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 um, professionals working together, um, politics is no different. And we should be working every day to find solutions on how we move our state and our country forward. So uh, I carry that attitude in the Missouri Senate. Uh, I don't put politics before practicality. If we see things that are um, moving our state forward, I don't see any reason, regardless of who the bill handler is or what party they come from, to determine um, whether or not I support it. Uh, also, in the Missouri Senate, there's also a unique body because we have 34 senators and regardless of party, they're all equal. We all have uh, procedural things that can be detrimental to what we care about. Uh, the filibuster is one of them. So that has allowed us to be uh, a lot more thoughtful uh, and a lot more diligent when we work on uh, issues and, and things that, that come through the legislature. For Representative Greyer, it was a very fortunate thing because he came up with a, uh, a piece of legislation that was going to be um, productive not only to our workforce, but ultimately move our state forward. So that's what we should be doing, whether his name had a, a RRD behind it, doesn't matter. Uh, in terms of uh, in the Missouri Senate, when this bill came up, um, I understood immediately that we need to be pushing folks back into the workforce and um, not into uh, prison. And one thing I would say, the concerns about folks saying, well, we have professionals with licenses that aren't professional, but then we also have professionals with licenses that's never been caught. So, <laughs> you know, this it's, it's, it's a very... Um, the scope of, of how we determine a professional. And, and I think sometimes to have someone who made a mistake and learn from it, serve their debt to society, whatever that may be, um, I would believe would have more of an appreciation for their career and second opportunity to be able to do something that they're good at and ultimately be able to support their family. And I would think that they would probably be a lot um, more um receptive to following the rules than, than breaking them because of those experiences. Uh, and, I, and I think we've seen it in, in the statistics that I stated earlier. Uh, states that embrace um, tackling recidivism, um, you see the, not only the, the numbers of, of crime um, dropping drastically, but you also see a drastic increase in employment and ultimately a well-rounded and strong workforce. And that's what we're looking to do here in Missouri. And we're hoping to set precedent for other states uh, to actually tackle this thing. Uh, we'll get into a little bit before we finish up, if I'm correct, Julie, where we'll talk about some other things that we've done in the legislature, like pass an expungement law. And with this, uh, in, I'll, I'll... No, 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 I was just gonna say, before we move on to questions from the audience, why don't you give, um, a rundown of that law, just because that is something that I think some some Wisconsin legislators and staffers would also be interested in hearing about, because um, Wisconsin had a, an expungement bill just last session that um, did not pass, but was extremely close. So if you could talk about that real quick, um, and then we can move on to some audience questions, that would be great. Sure. So uh, Senate Bill 952, under current law, there's a $250 surcharge on all petitions for expungements. However, a judge may waive the surcharge if the petitioner is found to be um, unable to pay the cost. So um, currently in state law that we passed, if someone has been uh, removed um, or has been removed at least um, five to seven years from supervised release um, for a, a crime, nonviolent offense, they can um, file a petition to have that expunged from their record um, or that arrest expunged. What we're looking to do this session is add a little bit more teeth to it, um, which I'll be filing a bill and be working very close with Representative Greyer uh, in the House to get this across the finish line, is um, taking that five to seven year period and actually changing the time limitation to three years if the offense um, is a felony in one year if the offense is a misdemeanor. And the reason I think this is important, and it's still for nonviolent offenses right now, um, I think this is extremely important because you have uh, a population of people um, throughout the country where they may have been a teenager and made a mistake. Five to seven years from being 16 or, or 18 years of age, that's a very 
in, important period of your life. And to go for a substantial amount of time at any point of your life being unemployed or, or in a situation where you're not eligible to, to uh, get a job because of a mistake or something that may have happened in the past that's on your record, then it, could, it can become even more detrimental in the future due to lack of work experience. So what we're trying to do is one, um, address this issue and give uh, folks an opportunity immediately to be able to go back in the workforce and prove that they can be uh, quality citizens and not have to wait five to seven years uh, from the time that, that, um, that they committed that offense. So we're just adding more teeth to it. I think this is um, a tremendous opportunity for Missouri to be able to tackle a population of folks who want to work, who wants to get back into the workforce, who may have made a mistake um, and, and learn from it, who may have made a mistake as a young person and that shouldn't contradict or, or really influence the rest of their lives. So this is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, we're really looking forward to, to working on this, this session and getting it across the finish line. But to think that we've already passed a bipartisan bill um, through the Missouri legislature to expunge records in Missouri shows that not only do we have an appetite for it, but there's also um, a, a sense of thoughtfulness to truly work towards meaningful criminal justice reform. And that's what this bill does here. Yeah, it's certainly a workforce issue as well. Like you said, you know, sometimes just getting that record record expunged um, is the last step someone needs to get a job or, or perhaps um, to look for a job. Um, so I, I wanna uh, turn to some questions. We have quite a few from the audience. Um, so I'll just, read them out and feel free, uh, either of you can answer them or you can answer them together. Um, first one I'll start with is, do you think that a universal recognition bill would have received bipartisan support without the fresh start portion of it? Go ahead and take it, Derek. Representative, I think you're on, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I, I don't know, Senator, you, you're on the other side of the aisle. You might be able to tell, tell me better than, uh, than I would know. Do you think uh, I would have received the, res the support without that fresh start piece? Um, I think so, because it, it, still, it still tackled the importance of addressing professional licensing, uh, which I think is, is is something that we have to be really just conscious of, making sure that there's a uniform uh, law in the state of Missouri, ensuring that uh, regardless of where you live, if you work in Missouri, you have a fair opportunity to work here. Um, I think the Fresh Start piece was was definitely something that was very helpful to it, but uh, I, I don't think it's fair to say had that Fresh Start piece not been in there, uh, this bill wouldn't have passed the Missouri Senate. I think it just um, highlighted it and gave it an opportunity for us to expand the scope and be able to really target some of the disparities and challenges in the urban areas of Missouri, like St. Louis and Kansas City. Uh, but I, I don't know if it's fair to say this bill would have failed had it not had the Fresh Start Act uh, as a part of the, the language. Well, that's that's good to know. And I, I mean, I, w I will say that it was a strategic decision to include that um, as well as a personal one, because I actually sponsored the Fresh Start legislation last year in the House. Um, and this year, I also sponsored it this year, but it was the Senate version of that Fresh Start bill that we ended up pairing up with uh, the license reciprocity and the apprenticeship. So we were really trying to combine as many good things as we could into the same bill so that we we gave people an excuse to support it uh, and to to see the good, like you said, Senator, to highlight all of the good in there. Um, and I, I, I was just absolutely thrilled that we were able to, to overcome some of the challenges uh, that we had initially. Uh, there were some industry groups that, that had some challenges with that fresh start piece, and we worked really, really hard together to make sure that we addressed those concerns um, so that we could have a product that, that could have unanimous support and get nearly everyone in the house on board as well. Yeah, and, and one more thing I want to add is that um, for those that, that work in, um, in government, especially in, in legislative bodies, 
uh, building relationships is extremely important. And uh, Representative Greyer did a tremendous job of just working the hallways, not only working with stakeholders in, in various groups, but stopping by and talking to, to different senators and, and colleagues throughout the, the General Assembly to inform and educate uh, members on what the details of the bill um, was, as well as um, how it would benefit Missouri. And, and I think him having those relationships and being very intentional about uh, talking about the bill and, and, and ensuring that everyone was informed uh, really worked in, in favor of this bill and, and really highlighted his um, commitment to working hard across the aisle to get things done in the legislature and ultimately making our state better. Well, another question we have, um, what were the arguments, concerns, arguments or concerns that you heard from opponents and how did you address or debunk them? Um, I'll, I'll start swinging on that one. So, you know, the, the biggest objections that we had was the, the fear-based objections about uh, license reciprocity and the potential for lowering Missouri's requirements to what another state would have because uh, you know when you when you accept another state's license or the training from another state you're basically saying whatever that state has is good enough for us and we're comfortable with that um, and so you know the the fear is that you're going to have um, people come that are not as well trained they're not as good uh, as they are uh, you know as our standards require them to be um, and the way that we overcame that objection was one, we added in some provisions. We said, hey, you have to have been a practicing uh, license professional in that state for at least a year. You have to be in good standing, right? So basically we're saying it should be based on your work experience. Uh, that, that our, our view and our judgment of you as a state is gonna be based on whether you're doing a good job in the state you're coming from and also, the other the other kind of way to debunk a lot of those that uh, much of that argument uh, is, you know, the standards are are very very similar with most of these professions. Most states the similar the standards are nearly identical. I mean, if you look at doctors, physicians, dentists, CPAs, I mean, all of these professions have the exact same standards across the entire country. And so if I travel to Colorado and I'm skiing and I break my leg and I go to the, the ER, the, the, the skill that I'm going to receive from the physicians in Colorado is going to be identical to what I would have in Missouri, right? The standards are the same already. So the idea that a, a practicing professional is going to come from a different state and suddenly corrupt our state and that there's going to be this, you know, influx of inexperienced terrible practitioners that are going to cause uh, a serious risk to the health and safety of people in Missouri is, is ridiculous. Uh, you know, and so a cosmetologist who comes from a state that has a thousand hours of required training versus 1500 hours of training in Missouri, that person may have been cutting hair or doing nails for 15 years. And we're going to say that they need another 500 hours of training to be able to come to Missouri and, and do the job they've already been doing for a long time, it's ridiculous. Uh, and when you start to highlight those and when you start to bring out specific examples too, it becomes very apparent uh, that that argument is typically used by uh, the special interest groups, by the industry groups that want to protect their industry and create barriers to competition. Um, I really truly believe that over the years that has been the main impetus for a lot of these licenses growing to what they are now is um, the industry groups are using the argument uh, of health, safety, and wellness to create greater barriers to entry, to make it harder for people to come into that profession that then create uh, uh, greater, you know, less competition. And I believe the free market is the best determining uh, factor for, uh, for these things. And that uh, the more of a, a free market we have, the better uh, and so we have to be very careful when we're using that health, safety, and wellness argument. And it has to be backed up by facts. It has to be justified with examples of how things have gone wrong in other states that have less requirements. So if you are, are concerned with a state that has 1,000 hours for cosmetology instead of 1,500 hours, tell me 
we're in that state with a thousand hours of requirement, there has been a problem. Tell me the practitioner, cite me an example of someone with a thousand hours versus 1500 hours that has locked off somebody's ear or caused a health uh, issue in that state. You won't be able to find them. And in every single case that that came up with this bill and there were objections, uh, we were able to, to go through that conversation and explain that this is a this this is not based in fact it's not based in reality well the next question you you kind of just addressed but i'm gonna ask it anyway and see if either of you have any anything else to add um how did the trade groups and organizations that represent licensed occupations receive this bill what were some of the main objections that you received from them Unless it is just the health, wellness, of, and safety. But if you have anything else to add to that question. No, I think um, Representative Greyer pretty much touched on it. I mean, you're going to have folks to have concerns about, um, you know, whether or not it, it's going to be a safety precaution and whether or not they'll be able to uh, um, navigate back into that profession. And we just had to kind of debunk some of those myths. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, the the initial response from most of the industry groups uh, is to bristle uh, and to to um, try and find reasons why we shouldn't do it. Uh, but again, once we go through the conversation and we talk about, OK, why are this? What are, what's the specific reasoning and justification for this? And cite me some examples of why this is important. When the conversation got to that point, it was it's pretty hard for some of these groups to justify it uh, when there are no examples and it's it's you know a lot of fear mongering. Um, and I think you know we're seeing a trend with this with with breaking down these barriers across the country. And I think a lot of these industry groups are are smart enough to understand that and they recognize that okay, look. We have had examples in other states, um, and we can help our industry group here understand that this isn't necessarily a bad thing, that this can be a good thing for the profession, um, that, and that this is a good thing for them, too. If, if they're able to, to move more freely and mobility in the workforce uh, is greater, that's, that's better for, for everybody. And we don't have to be so protectionist with our, our little group here in Missouri. We can expand it and, and be more inclusive and uh, and, and expand that mobility of work. So another, once again, somewhat related question um, related to the, the opposition. Um, do you have any issues working on this bill when it came to the unions in Missouri? Um, many unions in Wisconsin are opposed to licensing reform and have made it more difficult for some reforms to get passed. Hmm. No, I don't recall any uh, unions giving a significant uh, amount of pushback. I don't know about you, Representative Dreyer, but most most unions view this as an opportunity to, I mean, in Missouri, we actually have more jobs available than we actually have um, qualified or, or just folks that can actually attain them. So I, the unions, as well as um, business owners are, are looking to to gain and, and opportunities to be able to provide um, employment for as many people as possible. Uh, like I stated earlier, uh, that federal project, um, which is a National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and it's, it's, a, um, it's a facility that that will provide not only an additional um, 3,200 jobs in Missouri, but they're going to require construction jobs because they're building a roughly $1 billion facility. So today, if uh, we don't have enough uh, folks in Missouri that could actually do those jobs. And if you have uh, a criminal record or if you have um, some licensing issue, and I'm not saying necessarily for construction, but um, some licensing issue that preventing you from being able to do a job, regardless of your past or, or regardless of where you live, that can be a, a, a significant burden uh, for completing jobs in Missouri. And not only do we deprive our state of, of workers in our state, but it also uh, um, kind of prevents us from being able to pull in folks from, from surrounding states as well. Yeah, I, I would add to that, you know, the, initially there were some concerns and questions that I got from the unions 
uh, and some of our members in the house that are union members uh, about specifically like the apprenticeship piece of it, uh, because the unions do a really, really good job of training. I mean, they do an excellent job. If you go to some of the facilities that they have uh, and the training that they do with folks and the, the apprenticeship model that they use, it's really phenomenal. And so I think there was a concern there that, hey, we want to make sure this doesn't impede our ability to continue to train uh, the way that we do. And so once we were able to kind of assuage those concerns and talk through those and explain how this is offering more of an opportunity uh, and it's not going to like outside of the union structure, it's going to expand more opportunity and it's not going to inhibit your ability as a union to continue providing those. Uh, I, I think there was, there was broad support for it. Um, you know, the reciprocity piece, I will say that at the very end, uh, we were successful in keeping off any exemptions uh, from the bill until the very, very end uh, when it was going through the Senate uh, on, the, on the floor. There was one member that had some concerns uh, about reciprocity with some of the trades, uh, and we were able to make some concessions there uh, because a lot of those professions in Missouri aren't licensed anyways. Um, so it wasn't like, I, I didn't feel like it, it, um, was it caused significant harm to the overall bill itself and that it still was doing a tremendously significant amount of good. Um, but we were able to address some of those and we ended up having to exempt out a couple of those trade professions. Um, you know, I, I, I still strongly believe that it would be much better not to have those exemptions. And I would really love to, to take those out because I think for those professionals too in Missouri and, and that want to come to Missouri, I think it makes sense for all trades and all professions and that there shouldn't be exemptions. But again, you compromise, you work together. And that was something we needed to do to be able to get this across the finish line. And the good of this going to do is massive uh, across the entire country, not just in Missouri, because of the effect this is going to have in other states being able to use Missouri as an example, um, that, that certainly it was, it was more than worth uh, taking that compromise and, and doing that. And Representative, on that note, uh, we have a question in the chat box from Lee McGrath, um, and he's asking if those exemptions, if you think those exemptions were driven by the fresh start component, um, protectionism, apprenticeships, or perhaps all of the above. Yeah, it was it was mostly due to the reciprocity piece of it, uh, the, the the training. Um, they they I believe they wanted to keep that control in Missouri for what those specific requirements are going to be. Um, and I don't know whether that comes from a lack of trust in other states that there are significant differences between them. Um, but I just, I get the sense that it's more out of a desire to, to hold on to that control, um, which again, I mean, that's, that's pretty typical because in the state of Missouri, the licensed professionals, there's a board uh, that, that makes the determinations on who gets permission and who doesn't uh, and, and what those standards are going to be. And so with license reciprocity, we're basically saying okay, if you live in the United States and you have a professional license, Missouri is gonna, gonna recognize that. And uh, you know, we're, we're um, saying it's more broad than just Missouri and it does take away some of that control for the individual boards, which in my personal opinion is a good thing. Um, but it also, um, I, I think that was probably what was driving it with some of those trades. Um, and, and, you know, in my humble opinion, they're unfounded. The fears uh, that are there are unfounded and that uh, approach is, is not the appropriate one to have a more open workforce and to help Missourians and help people that want to plug into the jobs here in Missouri, but you make compromises. And that was one that we had to make. Yeah. Um, we have two more questions that I think we'll have time for. Um, I know this bill was signed in July, um, but have either of you seen measurable or anecdotal benefits since it became law from constituents or anyone from across the state who have benefited from it? Um, well, it's been, it's been probably a little bit different this time around because we are in the middle of a pandemic. So right. 
um, clearly just having that face-to-face interaction and, and seeing folks out and about has been limited. But I'm confident uh, once um, things open up more and, and we're able to, to kind of do, because it's, it's two folks to this. I mean, once you pass a law, you also have to spend time on the ground informing and educating the public on what these changes are and, and how they impact them. And clearly, we haven't been able to do that uh, like we've had in the past. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic as things uh, move forward, we'll have more opportunities to uh, publicly and, and, and be able to engage with folks throughout the state on not only what this law does, but how it benefits uh, everyday Missourians. So I, I think we kind of have a, we're kind of at a disadvantage right now, but I, I think as, as time progress and as we move closer to uh, 2021, I think we'll have a better opportunity to get more people engaged. And I'll, I'll just add to that. So I had the opportunity to meet with our division director last week, and we went through some of those questions. And um, certainly I'm, I'm very interested to continue to stay involved in the implementation of the law. You know, oftentimes uh, we forget about it once as legislators, we pass the law, that's the big win, and we get the bill signing and yay. Um, but really, to me, it's the implementation of it that is that is also just as important and so understanding how the department is doing and what they're doing to make sure that it's being implemented. And to your point, Senator, how are we promoting this and how are we sharing the information and the knowledge that now there is this opportunity for people to utilize this new law and the, 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 to take advantage of it? So what, what I learned in that meeting is that there are already professionals that are taking advantage of this. Uh, there are architects, there are Attor- not attorneys, I'm sorry, accountants, dentists, architects, uh, and many others was their comment to me um, that are already utilizing this. They'll have more specific numbers soon. Um, it's so new, but I was very pleased to learn that already uh, they are, are able to use this and they've been very supportive. We happen to have a division of professional registration here in Missouri that is extremely supportive of some of these changes and willing to work uh, with us. Sometimes you see um, that that's not always the case. Uh, in Missouri, we do happen to have a, a, a wonderful group and team that are working on this. So they are looking for ways uh, on their website to make sure, because if you're going to move to to Missouri and you already have, or to Wisconsin, and you have a professional license, the first thing you're probably going to do is look into well, how do I make sure I have permission from the government in the place I'm going to? Uh, so we want it to be very, very apparent, very, very available to them to get that information. So putting something like on the homepage of, you know, here's the information about this new bill and how do you utilize it? Uh, we're doing that. And we're also, again, working with the Department of Corrections to push this out into the prison system so that we can get that knowledge into the hands uh, of these folks so that they can they can start working on it now and, and they can be ready to hit the ground when they when they get out of prison. Yeah, well, we're, we're just about at 11, um, so I want to respect everyone's time. Um, there are still a few more questions, though. So Representative Greyer and Senator Williams, if people want to get in touch with you, can I just have them email me and, and we'll go from there? Um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, one, um, first, uh, thank you again for, for putting this together. Uh, Representative Greyer, uh, thank you so much for your leadership on this and, and us not only being able to work together, but I appreciate your friendship. In terms of those that are listening, um, you can find, I mean, I'm on various platforms. I'm on uh, Facebook, I'm on Twitter, uh, and it's, I'm on Instagram, and it's all B underscore Williams M.O., and that's for Brian Williams, Missouri. Um, I can also, um, you can email me, which Julie, you have um, our contact information uh, in terms of emailing our office if you have any questions. And I'm more than willing to set up Zoom meetings if, if um, our schedules allow and anything we can do to discuss this further. And clearly uh, once things open up, I'd love to have an opportunity to maybe do some things face-to-face and maybe representative and I can come up to Milwaukee or, or uh, some part of uh, Wisconsin yeah. and, and learn more about what they're doing up there as well. Yeah, yep. that sounds great. Echo everything the Senator just said. Same, same thing. Contact me. You'll find me just like you'll find Senator Williams all over. 
and uh, certainly reach out to Julie and uh, she'll share our contact information with you. But I, I, we are both just tickled to have the opportunity to help uh, other states look at this same thing. Because when you, when you really believe in something for your own state, you want to see other states do the same thing. So uh, I appreciate also like Lee McGrath who's on the call uh, and some of the other folks at the Department of Labor that, uh, that we have, may have on the call here that have been supportive. Uh, so there's, there's a network and there's a, a support group for you. Uh, if you want to dig into this issue, there's a lot of folks that are, are willing and ready to help. Yeah, and remember this, we root for everything Wisconsin itself for the brewers and the uh, Packers. <laughs> <laughs> a big asterisk then. I don't think that's everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much to, to Senator Williams, Representative Greyer, um, to speak to some Wisconsin people today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, like I said, we'll make this recording available to everyone on the call and anyone else within the next few days. Um, my email is julie at badgerinstitute.org if anyone has any follow-up questions. Um, but thanks again uh, to both of you for being here and thanks to everyone on the call as well.